All right, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. We've been doing a Bible overview, and what we're covering tonight is uh, very important. It's something that you need to know in order to be able to understand your Bible. And very few churches will teach this, and it's so important that we'll probably take two messages to do it. You know how slow I am to get through things. So, and what we're covering tonight is the, the change in the dispensation that took place when, uh, when God set aside Israel's program at the end of Acts chapter 7 at the stoning of Stephen. And then God starts a new dispensation or new program with the church, the body of Christ. He starts it with Paul in the uh, ninth chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, most of churchianity teaches that the current dispensation we're in today started in Acts chapter 2, but when you do that, you end up mixing, uh, when you believe that, you end up mixing what God's doing with Israel for, with what he's doing with us today. And if to, in order to understand your Bible, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 7, to consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. And the reason it says that is because Paul is our apostle. He's the one that wrote down the doctrine for us today. We talked about it Sunday that uh, he's not being egotistical. It's just that uh, Jesus Christ chose to reveal the instructions for today to Paul to give to us. And so we, if you want to follow what Jesus Christ has told us to do today, we have to follow what Jesus Christ told Paul, and Paul wrote down in Romans through Philemon. Last time we mentioned that the reason that Israel's program was put on hold with the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7 is that Israel had rejected all three members of the Godhead. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And the Father was rejected by Israel beheading John the Baptist. God the Son, of course, was rejected when Jesus Christ, being God the Son, was crucified. And then the last member of the Godhead, God the Holy Ghost. And that's what we're covering tonight, Him being rejected. If you go over to Acts chapter... One in Acts chapter one, you can see that this is perhaps the last thing that Jesus said. Uh, probably was the last thing that Jesus told his disciples before he left. He had Acts chapter one tells us in verse three that Jesus, after he rose from the dead, spent forty days with the disciples. In Acts chapter one, verse three. And he spoke of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That's very important to understand. When Jesus came, in fact, in Matthew chapter 4, it's interesting that the first thing, well, I mean, you have him in the um, temple, you know, at 12 years of age. But uh, when he actually started his ministry in Luke chapter, I'm sorry, Matthew, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, it says, uh, when Jesus started his ministry, it says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus, in Matthew 4, verse 17, begins his earthly ministry by preaching, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then when you're in Acts chapter 1, after his resurrection and before his ascension Jesus spent 40 days with the disciples and he as Acts 1 verse 3 says in those 40 days he spoke to them of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and then in verse 6 Acts chapter 1 verse 6 it says when they therefore were come together they asked of him saying Lord wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel so my point is, is that when Jesus began his earthly ministry, he was preaching the kingdom of heaven was at hand, and just before he ascended up into, into heaven, he was talking about the kingdom of God as well. And the fact that, that you have the apostles asking specifically, wilt thou at this time 
restore again the kingdom to Israel. Now in verse 7, he doesn't tell them. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then in verse 9 it says, When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So, my point is that from the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry to the time that he ascended to the Father, even though he was crucified by Israel, his whole focus was the kingdom of God. The, at hand, the, the kingdom of heaven was at hand, and according to the timeline that we've talked about before from Daniel 70 weeks, we were toward the end of that, and that made the kingdom of heaven be at hand. And so even after his resurrection, Jesus was still talking about the kingdom to Israel. There was no change in dispensation here. And so then the Holy Ghost is given in Acts chapter 2. And you can see in Acts chapter 2, uh, when the Holy Ghost is given, you know, people are thinking, well, what is this? They start speaking in other tongues, and they're able to understand those tongues knowing that the speakers don't know the tongues. They're speaking in known languages, except the languages are not known to the speakers, to the disciples. And so they're thinking, well, what's going on? And you can see in verse 14 of Acts 2, Acts 2, 14, it says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lift up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. Go down to verse 22. Acts 2.22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Verse 36, Acts 2, verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. So you can see that um, Jesus, they were talk, talked with the disciples for 40 days after his resurrection about the kingdom of God, and the disciples believe that, and they've been taught basically that the kingdom of heaven is still at hand because they ask the question, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? If it was not at hand at that time, you know, Jesus would have at least told them and said, well, why are you talking about that? Don't you understand that uh, Israel rejected me by crucifying me and so now I'm going to start the church, the body of Christ. See, he doesn't say that. Um, and so they, they know that the kingdom message continues. And so you see there in Acts 2, Peter, by the way, he is filled with the Holy Ghost when he says this. So the Holy Ghost is speaking through Peter. And he addresses in verse 14, ye men of Judea. And verse 22, ye men of Israel. And verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. So you can see that the middle wall of partition between Israel and the Gentiles is still up at this time. What Jesus started, which was going to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, is continued at this time by the disciples. And the reason for that is this parable here. If you go to Luke chapter 13, Luke chapter 13, we had closed with this parable last week, but just had a minute or two. So we want to go through the, the details of this uh, tonight because again it shows it, you know contrary to popular belief it, most of churchianity teaches that once Jesus was crucified then God said that Israel had rejected their Messiah and so now God was going to go to uh, all nations and so then that's why the speaking in tongues began in Acts chapter 2 and the church then starts in Acts 2 but we can see as we've seen tonight, that from the verses we mentioned in Acts 1 and Acts 2, that the focus is still on the kingdom of heaven being at hand, and Israel is still God's favored nation. Even though they're speaking, they're speaking in other tongues, that doesn't mean they're to go to the Gentiles. They're speaking in other tongues because Israel, in that fifth cycle of chastisement that they're under, they, according to Leviticus 26, they were to be scattered among the heathen. And so it's, it's not the Gentiles who are coming and hearing the wonderful things of God in their own tongues. It's Jews who are coming to the day of Pentecost because that's what a good male Jew would do. He would go to the temple in Jerusalem on Pentecost. And so it's Jews that come to, the, to the, where the disciples are on the day of Pentecost. It's Jews who hear those tongue-talking 
and it's because they, due to the fifth cycle of chastisement, they're scattered abroad. You know, just like today, there are a lot of Jews in different countries. They're not all in the nation of Israel, and there are a lot of them who don't even know Hebrew because if they grow up in a different country, uh, they, they're not familiar with that language. And so the sign of the tongues isn't to show that God is going to go to Gentiles at this time, but it's rather for God to continue gathering the lost sheep of the house of Israel uh, back to himself. And since they're scattered abroad and speak different languages, then... Um, the Holy Ghost eliminates that bar that language barrier by having the disciples speak in the languages of those uh, other of those Jews that he's trying to save. And we can see from Luke 13 and verses 6 through 9 that uh, Jesus had already spoken before his crucifixion that God would extend he would give a one year grace period to the nation of Israel after Jesus resurre resurrection. Uh, they wouldn't go to the Gentiles right away. They would still, uh, Israel's program would continue and the kingdom of heaven would still be at hand for another year. Luke 13, verse 6. Luke 13, verse 6 says, He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. So that's God the Father there has a fig tree. Fig tree in your Bible is a type of religion. It's planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. So that was when Jesus Christ came uh, for uh, his earthly ministry, John the Baptist and then Jesus Christ. And not finding fruit means he didn't find people who were believing God and his word. They were still trusting in their own self-righteousness, the Jewish religious system of the Pharisees and Sadducees. You can see from verse 7, it says, Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. The fig tree being religion. So here's the Jewish religious system that the Pharisees are over and Jesus comes to find fruit for three years. That would be from Matthew 4 when he started preaching the at-hand phase of the kingdom to the time when Jesus was crucified. And he finds none, meaning uh, the nation as a whole. And now, of course, there is a believing remnant. It doesn't mean there's nobody saved, but, but you see there it says, I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. The fig tree is the religion. So it's just like today. You know, we are a group of Bible-believing Christians. We're going to heaven. We believe the gospel. Uh, Christ is living in us to the extent that we have a sound doctrine built up in our inner man and allow Christ to live in us. And so we, we can do those things. But it's apart from a church system. If I go to any denomination and I try to get fed through that denominational system, I'm not going to be growing as much as if I'm a Bible believer because they have their own traditions. And so that's how it was here. He comes to seek fruit on the fig tree of the Jewish religious system for three years and finds none. So God the Father says to God the Son, Cut it down, why cumbereth the ground? In verse 8, he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. So this is Jesus Christ telling the God the Father, give me another year. I've been here three years and you don't have the, the fruit, but let's have another year. And uh, digging about it and dung it this just basically means you're you're fertilizing it. That's what dung does. And digging about it means you're trying to get weeds out or you know make sure it's good soil there. There's a parable of the sower, the good ground that's mentioned in that parable. Um, so here's he, he's trying to get the good ground there going, uh, get some good fertilizer there. And basically what that refers to is that one year period in which the believing remnant of Israel is going to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel with the gospel of the kingdom, with signs and wonders, um, telling them to get away from the apostate nation and that religious system of it. And it will be for one year. And, uh, and we're going to see next, you know, why. Because it's a different situation with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was working through Jesus Christ, certainly. But... The Holy Ghost was not given to the disciples until after 
uh, Jesus had ascended to the Father. And we'll get to that. It may not be today, maybe next week. But it's important to understand the, the circumstances are different. Instead of just having one man, Jesus Christ, who the Holy Spirit is working through, He's doing the miracles and the signs. When the Holy Ghost is given to all the believers, in Acts chapter 2, you have 120 men there who receive the Holy Ghost and they start speaking in tongues and they can do the miracles and the different things. As more and more people believe, then the Holy Ghost can uh, work in more people. So instead of having one person, Jesus, being Holy Ghost filled, you have 120. And then on the first day in Acts 2, you know, when Peter preaches the message of repent and be baptized, Acts 2.41 says that same day 3,000 souls were added. So now you got 3,120 Holy Ghost filled people who can go to the nation. And so Jesus' point then is I was basically just one man doing this, but we're going to have a lot more when I give the Holy Ghost out. So let's see what the nation of Israel, how, that, how they respond under that ministry. So let's give it a year. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. So this is the one-year grace period that Jesus Christ gets for the nation of Israel. And that explains, that's why we say that the first seven chapters of the book of Acts are approximately one year long. Uh, you don't really have time markers in those chapters, but you can read the events and it makes sense that all those things could have happened in one year. And so that's why really we move the, the, this right here is the reason why we say that the dispensation of grace starts, the current, today's dispensation did not start in Acts 2, but it started in Acts 9, is because of this one year grace period. And so this is a very important time marker because if you don't recognize this and you say that the body of Christ starts in Acts 2, then you've got a whole lot of problems. It really changes your doctrine around. So I want you to uh, understand um, where we're getting this from. First off, um, you notice the parable here is it's the vineyard. In Luke 13, verse 6, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And then verse 7, Jesus Christ is identified as the dresser of the vineyard. And so I want to go through a few verses in the Old Testament which show that Israel is referred to as God's vineyard. So that, you know, you say, well, you're just making it up to make it fit what you want it to fit. Well, no, these things mean something. If you've read and understood your Bible up to Luke at this point, then you would know uh, that the fig tree is religion, that the vineyard is Israel, that the certain man would be God the Father, that the dresser would be God the Son, uh, and then the one-year period would be the God the Holy Ghost working during that time. Uh, let's look over in Psalm chapter 80. Psalm chapter 80. and If you have that outline that I gave out, uh, it was emailed out both today and also last Tuesday, uh, we're on the third point under God the Holy Ghost rejected and it says Israel is God's vineyard. I wanted to make a point, there's, a, there's an omission in here that in the references when we get to Matthew, I've got Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 through 16, then the rest are verse references. The rest of the verse references should be chapter 21. So it's chapter 21 verses 28 through 32 and verses 33 through 42. So um, I omitted that 21 there. Okay, so with that, uh, Psalm 80, Psalm 80 and uh, verse 8, Psalm chapter 80, verse 8, talking about God here, it says, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Well, we know from the book of Exodus that Israel came out of Egypt and then God brought Israel into the promised land, which is where the heathen were, the Canaanites. And so the, the vine then, bringing a vine out of Egypt, casting out the heathen in the promised land, and then planting the vineyard in that promised land, that's what God did with the nation of Israel. And then if you look over in Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah chapter 5, it's probably a clearer Reference to Israel being the vineyard of God. 
Isaiah chapter 5, and uh, I don't know if you still have Luke 13, but um, anyway, we'll read Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved, so the well-beloved there is Israel, and uh, he even says he is the firstborn, my firstborn son that came out of Israel, it says, now will, I'm sorry, came out of Egypt. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. So it's called, there you have the well-beloved there, uh, Jesus Christ having um, a vineyard, which is the nation of Israel. You can see in verse 2, it says, He fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof, and planted it with the choicest vine. So that should remind you of Luke 13, where it said that he um, he dug. Was it he he's he's going to dig about it and dung it? Well, you can sort of see that there. He plants that vineyard in Isaiah 5 2. He fences it. He gathers out the stones thereof. That's digging around it there. Planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. So the grapes, remember from Luke 13, he says he planted a vineyard, but there was no fruit on it. Well, this here says there is fruit, but the problem is it's wild grapes. It's not fruit that is part of the vine, which tells you that they are not being nourished by God, but they are following paganism, idolatry. Uh, so then, um, verse 4 what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. This is a prophecy, it was written in the time of Isaiah before Israel went into the 70 years of captivity. And then we know from our studies, our Bible overview, that after they came back into the land, it wasn't too long after they came back from captivity that uh, you had the 400 year period of silence from God between Malachi and Matthew where God did not send any prophets or any word from the Lord. And so the prophecy here is fulfilled with uh, because they, the wild grapes symbolizing paganism or idolatry, uh, other religions that Israel got into. So he says, I'm going to let it go, let it lay waste, let it be taken captive, and I'm not going to prune it or dig around. In other words, I'm not going to send my word to them. I'm not going to send prophets. And they're going to come up briars and thorns. Briars and thorns, a type of the curse. When Adam was given the, the curse of sin, it says that thorns and thistles will come up from the ground. And so instead of it being the fig tree that it was supposed to be in the vineyard here, it ends up being uh, the curse of sin, briars and thorns. No, uh, I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. So again, that's showing no prophets coming. So you can see how this relates to Israel and if you, and from the time of Isaiah's prophecy to the time of John the Baptist coming on the scene when the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And then God commends... Uh, uh, goes back to digging around and dunging it and trying to uh, get Israel to turn to him. It, it's sort of like, you know, if you've heard, I've heard anyway, where let's say somebody is an alcoholic and they want to, uh, it, you have to, you can't just go up to somebody who's an alcoholic and say, stop drinking, because they're not going to do that. They have to get a determination in their mind that they're not going to do it anymore. And they say that the person has to hit what they call rock bottom. So they have to get to the point where who knows what it is. His wife leaves him or he loses his job or or he gets arrested for drunk driving. I don't know. Whatever it is, something has to happen to the point. Usually something really bad has to happen before the person will say, I've got a problem. I need help. And then they commit to not drinking anymore. That's sort of what you can see what God is doing here. God gives all kinds of blessings to Israel. He took him, remember Psalm 80, he took him out of Egypt. He brought him, uh, he took, drove out the heathen, 
planted Israel in the land, gave them Saul, gave them David, gave them wonderful victories over those uh, the nations under those kings. Uh, Solomon, great riches, ruling the whole world under Solomon. So they get all these blessings, and yet they turn against God. They serve other gods, pagan gods. And so God says, well, I tried the blessing route, so now I've got to try the cursing route. And basically, you've got to hit rock bottom. And that's why they're under the fifth cycle of chastisement uh, when Jesus comes. It's basically, they have to hit rock bottom before they will finally turn back to the Lord. So that's why he does this in this 400 years or so. And, and in case you didn't get that this was talking about Israel, you can see in verse 7, Isaiah chapter 5 verse 7 tells you, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. He looked for judgment, but behold oppression, for righteousness, but behold a Christ. So you're told specifically here, the vineyard of the Lord is the house of Israel. Look over in Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah chapter 12. Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse, um, verse 10. Jeremiah 12 and verse 10. Many pastors, so that's talking about the religious leaders of the Jews, many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate, a desolate wilderness. Um, so again, you can see there's the religious leaders and you can see Israel being referred to as a vineyard. And then you can go over to Matthew chapter 20 and there are parables that Jesus talks about. Parable of the vineyard. Why does he have, he's got a couple different parables of vineyards here in Matthew 20 and 21. Why does he have them? Well, because Israel is his vineyard. They, we're told about that in Psalm 80, Isaiah 5, Jeremiah 12, and now Matthew 20, verse 1, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 1. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. The laborers then would be those who go, the vineyard is Israel, so it's the laborers would be those who go and preach the gospel of the kingdom to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You can see in verse 2, there are laborers who, plan, who uh, agree to work for a day. In verse 3, he sees at, at the third hour there are others standing idle and he gets them to work. Um, in verse 5, he went out about the sixth hour and uh, got more people to work. In the ninth hour, he got more people. And then verse 6, in about the eleventh hour, he went and found others standing idle and got them to work in his vineyard as well. So this is a, a type of Israel because you can see that when the at hand phase of the kingdom is there, you've got uh, God beseeching pretty much you know Israel to go out and be the laborers. He says the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. He sends out John the Baptist to get laborers. Jesus then does it. Then you've got the, the 12 disciples. You've got the 70 disciples. You've got, uh, during the 11th hour, that could be a reference there to that uh, one-year period with the Holy Ghost because it's that last-ditch effort, basically. So there's the little flock of Israel in early part of Acts. So you can see these things happening in the, um, at different times there, in it, but it's all in that vineyard. Uh, Matthew 21, this is where I made the error on the outline. Uh, Matthew chapter 21, verse 28. Matthew 21 and verse 28. Jesus says, But what thank you? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, "Go, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not, but afterward he repented and went. Came to the second, said likewise, um, and he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whither of them twain did the will of his father? They say unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. 
But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. So you can see here in this parable that you've got uh, a vineyard that's mentioned in verse 28, and then the ones who will work in the vineyard are related to the publicans and the harlots because they're the ones who believe. And it says they go into the kingdom of God before you. So it's interesting. Verse 28, vineyard. Verse 31, kingdom of God. So they're related. Vineyard being the nation of Israel. You know, why does he choose a vineyard? Well, that's because Israel is his vineyard. And then uh, the next parable there, verse 33, after he tells them about that, then he says here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard. There we go again with the vineyard hedged it round about, digged a wine press in it, and built a tower. Remember what we read in Isaiah 5. It's the same wording there. In fact, I'll, I'll go get that read it to you so you can see why you're looking at Matthew 21 there. Isaiah 5 and verse 2 says, He fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. In Matthew 21, 33, he planted a vineyard, hedged it round about, digged a wine press in it, and built a tower. Very similar to what's in Isaiah chapter 5. And then verse 34 now, Matthew 21, verse 34, when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruit of it. And the husbandmen, that would be the religious leaders in this case, they're the ones in charge of that, that religious system, took his servants and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, of course we know who that is, Jesus Christ, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. And in case you don't understand, again, you can see the vineyard is Israel. The, uh, the, the Lord plants that vineyard and just like he did in Isaiah 5. You can see the, the type being fulfilled here. The husbandmen being the religious leaders. Um, obviously, the son has got to be Jesus Christ. And in case you didn't understand that, he even tells you in verse 42... Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. And we know from several passages that that stone, the cornerstone, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And him being rejected by the builders is the Pharisees or the religious leaders reje rejecting Jesus. And in case he still didn't get it, verse 43, he comes out very plainly and tells you, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Remember Luke 13. He found no fruit. Here, there is no fruit. The kingdom of God is taken away from the Pharisees and given to a nation, the little flock of Israel, who will bring forth the fruits thereof. And again, you can see, just like we saw in verses 28 through 32, where he mentions the vineyard, and then he talks about the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Here, again, the vineyard is equated to the kingdom of God because they're, they're working in the vineyard. The religious leaders um, destroy those servants, you know, destroying John the Baptist, killing prophets and people before that. Um, and then, of course, Jesus, the Son, comes, and again, you can see the vineyard, but then he also, in verse 43, relates it to the kingdom of God. So, all of that to say, and I know we spent a lot of time on it, but it's very important to understand, because if you go back to Luke 13 now, you know, it's very easy for me to take four verses and just tell you, well, this is what they mean. But the, the thing is, it doesn't matter what I mean, what, what I say. It matters what God's Word says. And it's very important if I say that Luke 13, 6 through 9 is telling us that the church did not start in Acts 2, 
but it started in Acts 9. Well, then it's very important that, I mean, for you to believe, that's going to change doctrine tremendously uh, based on where you put the start of the church. And so we need to make sure that this interpretation of Luke 13, 6 through 9 is correct. So that's why we spent all that time going over these vineyard passages. Um, so again, going back to Luke 13, verse 6, remember what we read in Matthew 21. He says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, that's the little flock of Israel, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And so here in Luke 13, verse 6, he spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Well, based on Psalm 80, Isaiah 5, Jeremiah 12, Matthew 20, and Matthew 21, we know what the vineyard is by now. I'm not just making this up. we got several verses that back up that the vineyard is the nation of Israel. And the fig tree then would be that religion that's planted in there. We've seen, like from the Jeremiah 12 passages, that the pastors um, use that fig tree for their own gain, financial gain, rather than um, doing the Lord's work, rather than teaching God's word. They taught their religious system. So he had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. We just read in Matthew 21 that the Pharisees did not bring forth fruit in God's vineyard. And there's going to be a nation, which is the little flock, that is going to bring forth the fruit thereof. And you know that it's a little flock if you go back to Luke 12. Just turn the page back, one page there, and Luke 12, verse 32. Luke 12, 32, Jesus says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So we know that the nation bringing forth the fruits thereof from Matthew 21, 43 has to be the little flock because he says he's going to give the kingdom to a nation bringing forth the fruit thereof. And in Luke 12, 32, he says the little flock's going to get the kingdom. So that must be the nation that brings forth the fruit thereof. So when you go to Luke 13 now and you see that he saw he found no fruit in verse 6, in those three years, verse 7, it says, These three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Well, we know then that that's got to be a reference to the religious system that is in the, in the vineyard of the nation of Israel not bringing forth spiritual fruit because they're propagating their own religion, which is paganism. It's man-made things. That's why Isaiah 5 talks about the wild grapes that grew out of it. Oh, I brought fruit fruit. All right, but bad fruit. It was wild grapes. It wasn't natural for that vine because it brought it from paganism or from another religion rather than what God had set up there. And so then in verse 8, Luke 13, 8, He answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. You notice from Matthew 21, 43 that Jesus promised he says he's going to give the kingdom to a nation bringing forth the fruit thereof. That is the believing remnant of Israel based on Luke 12, 32. But you notice when he goes back to the nation as a whole, the physical nation of Israel, he doesn't say that they are bringing forth the fruit thereof. He's saying we're going to give that whole apostate nation of Israel one more year. And if that nation brings forth fruit, then they are part of the little flock, the believing remnant of Israel, so then that's well. But if not, it says, then after that thou shalt cut it down. He's not going to cut down the little flock, because remember, they're bringing forth the fruit thereof, and he says he's going to give the kingdom to the little flock. So we can't say that we are spiritual Israel today, because God is already separating out spiritual Israel from physical Israel. And Physical Israel continues to have favored nation status until this one year is over. At the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7, which we'll get to next week to talk about that, that is when they have the, the apostate nation of Israel did not bring forth fruit in that year. The believing remnant, the little flock did. So that's why once God starts the new program, the dispensation of grace, the church, the body of Christ, you still have epistles that are written, 2 Peter, for example, 1 Peter, um, 
probably first, second, third John, written after the dispensation of grace started. Because the nation, uh, the believing remnant of Israel is given the promise of the kingdom of God because they're the ones bringing forth fruit. And the physical nation of Israel has the opportunity to leave the apostate nation that is following the religious leaders and the nation as a whole then can join the little flock and be part of that nation. They have a one-year time period to do that in. But if they don't do it at the end of that one year, then Israel is cut off. The, the nation of Israel, the physical nation, and but the believing remnant of Israel continues on because they're bringing forth the fruit thereof and God says he's going to give the kingdom of God to them. If we become spiritual Israel today, then Jesus lied to the, his disciples because he told them in Matthew 21, I'm going to give the kingdom, I'm going to take the kingdom away from the Pharisees and I'm going to give it to you, uh, br a nation bringing forth the fruit thereof. And then in Luke 12, he identifies that nation as the little flock. So if he then, here's the believing remnant of Israel, right? Now, the physical nation, according to Luke 13, has one year to join the believing remnant. But if they don't, then the physical nation's cut down to the ground. But if God then says, well, since you didn't, since the nation as a whole didn't believe, then I'm going to take believing remnant of Israel, and now you're just going to be part of the church, the body of Christ, and you're all going to be spiritual Israel, well, then he's not being faithful to the promise that he gave them. He says, I'm going to give it to a nation. That nation is the believing, believing Israel. Galatians 6.16 6 calls it the Israel of God. Go over to Acts chapter 2. Um, that's, and that's what, that's what Peter is getting at in Acts 2. When we read in Acts 1 verse 3, when we started, that Jesus spent 40 days speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God to those apostles. I think those 40 days, he's explaining what we're going through tonight. It's that, remember what I told you, that I was going to take the kingdom of God from the Pharisees and give it to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Remember when I told you in Luke 12, well, he wouldn't say Luke 12, but remember when I told you that as, my, as Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, little flock, the little flock is going to get it. So you're still building the kingdom of God. The reason back in Acts 1 and verse 6 when the disciples asked him, will you at this time again restore the kingdom of Israel? The reason in verse 7 he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, is basically he's saying it's up to the physical nation of Israel to decide to join you, believing remnant little flock, or not. And it's not up to you to know what's going to happen in the future. But what's going to happen with you is you're going to get the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon you and you're going to be witnesses to them and then you'll see what happens. God isn't going to reveal the future. So that's why when you get to Acts 2, when they ask, when the speaking in tongues happens and they ask, well, what means this? What's going on here? That's why Peter, remember being full of the Holy Ghost, addresses in verse 14, Acts 2, 14, ye men of Judea. Why he addresses them in verse 22, ye men of Israel. And why he addresses in verse 36, the house of Israel. He's not talking to Gentiles. The kingdom message is continuing. That one-year program of digging about and dunging it by the Holy Ghost ministry through the little flock of Israel has started. And now the, phys the physical nation of Israel has one year to decide if they are going to leave the religious system because remember, Jesus said the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you, Pharisees. So what are you going to do? Are you going to go down to hell with the Pharisees? Or are you going to go into the kingdom of God with the little flock? Because you can see in Acts 2, the language that he gives here in verse uh, 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. You are guilty of the blood of your Messiah. 
by wicked hands you, you murdered your own Messiah. Uh, you're guilty of that. But, of course, verse 24, God's raised him up from the dead. And God gives them another chance. Jesus from the cross said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Go to Acts 3. Look in Acts 3. In Acts 3, here is uh, Peter, again, doing another sermon to uh, Israel here. And he says, regarding uh, Jesus, it said, uh, verse 15, Acts 3, verse 15, it says, you killed the prince of life, again, whom God hath raised from the dead. Uh, so they're subject to God's wrath. In fact, if you go back to Acts 2, you can see that in Acts 2. So they, by wicked hands, cru crucified and slain Jesus. God raised him from the dead. And now, verse 32, Acts 2.32, Acts 2.32, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. And it's not just that he just rose from the dead. Being raised up means, verse 33, Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. This is the ministry of the Holy Ghost, through the little flock that one year period. And we'll, uh, you know, we won't have time tonight, but next week we'll go through that ministry of the Holy Ghost for that one year. Through the little flock, Jesus having the power, being at the right hand of God exalted, and that's another thing too, and that's what we'll go over next week, is Jesus now has the power. He's conquered death and hell. He's spoiled principalities and powers. He has the keys of hell and death in his hand. Uh, he says in Matthew 28, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He's got all power. That's why he is able to send the Holy Ghost. And we'll, we'll go through all that next week. So now is, again, a renewed opportunity for Israel. But you can see they're guilty of the, of the blood of Christ. They, by wicked hands, have crucified him. But now he's at the right hand of God exalted. And verse 34, David is not ascended to the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Christ means he was the Messiah. Lord means he's over all. If he's sitting at the right hand of God in the heavens then he has all power, as he says in Matthew 28, all power, or Matthew 28, 18. All power is given unto me, both in heaven and in earth. And so he has the power at the right hand of the Father. They've crucified him. He has the power to completely obliterate them if he wanted to. But going back to Acts 3, you see in verse 17, Acts 3, 17, when they killed the prince of life, it says... And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance he did it, as did also your rulers. The law would say, you're guilty of the blood of the Messiah, you must be killed. There would be no chance for forgiveness. But, because they did it in ignorance, they get another chance. Which is why Jesus said from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that's why the ministry to Israel continues for another year with greater power because now the Holy Ghost, because Jesus, number one, by him conquering death and hell and exalted at the right hand of the Father, he now has the ability to send the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost can indwell every believer and you can have the signs of the speaking in tongues, casting out devils, raising the dead, signs accompanying the, uh, the gospel being presented so you have the power of the Holy Ghost working through every member of, of the little flock. I mean, we take, we take the Holy Ghost for granted today. The Holy Ghost is given to all of us who believe. If you were in the Old Testament, that did not happen. David was given the Holy Ghost. Some guys who built the temple was given the Holy Ghost. A couple judges, a couple kings. That's about it. All those believers back there. If you're just an ordinary believer, you believe God and His Word... Yeah, you're going to have eternal life in the kingdom, but you did not have the indwelling Holy Ghost. God did not have the power to bring the indwelling Holy Ghost into people's lives 
on a permanent basis until Jesus sat at the right hand of the Father because he didn't have the keys of hell and death in his hand yet. And so here he says, now let's try it for a year with the Holy Ghost filling every single believer and now let's see if the house of Israel believes. So going back to M, so they get that opportunity because they killed him in ignorance and now going back to Acts 2, verse 37, Acts 2, 37, and when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? I mean, they're shaking in their boots right there. You got to think, here's Jesus by wicked hands. I've crucified and slain him. And now he's sitting at the ultimate position of power at the right hand of God. And he's Lord over me. If I killed my Lord, don't you think that I wouldn't be in too good a favor with him? So they're thinking, what are we going to do? I mean, it's too late now. We already did it. Well, Acts 3, 17 says, through ignorance they did it. So Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. So they don't get punished. Instead, they get a renewed opportunity. So then in verse 38, Acts 2, 38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So they've got the opportunity, the gift of the Holy Ghost, ministry of the Holy Ghost for that one year there. And notice in verse 40, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. So remember Luke 13, the parable. God says, I've only got I, three years. Here's my son. He found no fruit. Let's get rid of this vineyard, meaning let's cut off Israel. Let's start the dispensation of grace is basically what he had in mind there. Of course, he doesn't reveal it, but uh, that's what he had in mind. Jesus says, now wait a minute, let's give him another year. I'll send the Holy Ghost down. Now that I'll be at the position of power after conquering death and hell. I'll send the Holy Ghost. He'll indwell every single believer. And let's give them another year. And then, once the year is done, then if they don't bear fruit, then let's go ahead and cut it down. That's why the statement is made in Acts 2.40, save yourselves from this untoward generation. The generation is not toward God, it's untoward. It's the opposite of toward, untoward. It's going down into the pit of hell. And God's about to cut it off. He almost cut it off, but he gave him one year grace period. So Peter is saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Be, get away from the apostate nation that the kingdom of God has taken away from and save yourself by joining the nation bearing forth the fruit thereof that the kingdom of God is given to, which is the little flock of Israel. So again, you can see all of this is completely aligned with prophecy of Israel, with the vineyard, and what happened in, uh, during Jesus' day, and then what happened after he was crucified, and the events after that. There's no, there's no break in the action here. There's six... God isn't saying, oh, let's put Israel aside because they crucified their Messiah. Let's start the church, the body of Christ. No, you say, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You see that he, he says through ignorance that they did this. Peter says, you've got an opportunity to be saved from the untoward generation. Israel is going down to hell. They're about to be cut off because of their unbelief. If you follow the Pharisees, you, you didn't bear forward any fruit. The, the physical nation's not going to be part of that promise, but the Israel of God is. So get out of, he said in Isaiah, said, come out from among them, be ye separate. Get away from the apostate nation, join the believing remnant of Israel. And so that's where the message is. So um, next time what we'll do is we'll go over um, Acts 7 with the stoning of Stephen and we'll show, because what happens there is that Jesus, he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And what churchianity does is says, Oh, isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Jesus standing to welcome home the first Christian martyr. That's so wonderful. But, and that's a, that's a good thought. I mean, Jesus, I'm sure, did welcome Stephen home. I'm not saying he didn't. But Scripture indicates that's not why he stood. He stood in judgment of his people for their apostasy. And it's right in line with that parable of Luke 13. And we'll go through that next time. And so then that way you can see 
that the, the, the Israel's program put on hold at that time. But I, I thought this, this point was necessary to get this background here because churchianity has you jump in Acts 2 and say, oh, the Holy Ghost is given, so that's the church today, and God starts the church there, and we're a continuation of that. And as you can see from the verses we covered today, Acts 2 doesn't start something new. Rather, it's a continuation of the kingdom program for Israel. And they've got yet another opportunity. And that's what God's love is all about anyway. I mean, the reason that mankind... You think about it, Adam sinned 6,000 years ago. And mankind's history for 6,000 years has been to reject God and His Word. Whatever God's Word was, mankind rejects it, goes his own way. And yet... For 6,000 years, we're still not destroyed. The earth is still here. You know, if, if I was God, psh, it would have been destroyed a long time ago. There's no way I would have lasted 6,000 years. It shows God's long-suffering, His love. He gives us chance after chance after chance, and when you blow it, He gives you another chance after chance after chance. Uh, it's God's love that He keeps trying to get people saved. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that even though God says, here's the 70 weeks of Daniel... And now we're toward the end with Jesus' uh, crucifixion. He still gives them chance after chance after chance because he loves them and wants them to be saved. And praise God for his mercy and his grace toward us. Uh, dear Lord, we just thank you for your grace, your love. We thank you that you saw fit to send the Apostle Paul to give us instructions for today. Help us, Lord, to rely upon them, to live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God not to take your mercy for granted and go in the flesh thinking, oh, I'll be okay, but to appreciate the opportunity that we have to have Christ live in us, living by the faith of the Son of God, so that we may be good ambassadors for Christ, so that others may be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.